Welcome. Thank you for taking the time for participating today and joining our discussion with regards to the on the ground situation concerning textile waste, both on industrial level and post consumer level. My name is Rakesh and I have the pleasure of being the host and having with me a group of experts uh, and passionate personnel who have invested their time, their sweat and their blood looking at the topic of textile waste and what can be done to improve the situation so that more of that value remains in the hand of the producer. As we start off, I want to also say that um, thanks to all of you for participating from different parts of the world. So, uh, ni hao, konnichiwa, sin chao, namaste, salam, uh, hello, and ciao. Thank you for joining us and for taking time. What's also interesting to see is the interest that we have from almost every stakeholder in the supply chain, from the brands um, to the testing service providers of our peers, to tier one factories, tier two factories, uh, industry associations, uh, recyclers, NGOs, and, and consultants uh, who hopefully will support the industry moving ahead. We asked you during registration on what are you experiencing? What are you witnessing about this topic of waste, textile related waste? And what you have indicated to us is that a quarter of the cases, this waste is being sold to waste producers and recyclers. You've also mentioned that there are situations where waste is being sold to aggregators who are then passing it forward. And we asked you, how are you managing the waste? How are you segregating it? You all mentioned to us that a lot of you are separating it as either cutting waste or fabric end roll, but also by raw material and by color and composition. This is on the industrial level, on post-industrial or pre-consumer level. Here are the variation depending on where you are based. So we see there's a slight difference uh, in the case of Bangladesh and Pakistan, just as an example. And finally, we asked you during registration, what do you feel should be the area of focus? And you all mentioned, one quarter of you mentioned that the emphasis should be on post-consumer garments waste. So for that, we have accelerating circularity today. We also mentioned that equal emphasis and focus should be on post-industrial textile waste. So we also will hear stories about this along with experiences from Cambodia and an ongoing research project. We will have, uh, we will get to hear, first of all, from Recycle Raw, from Mr. Abdul Razak, who will share with us on the ground situation in terms of getting this post-industrial textile waste in terms of recommendations on what should be changed or what they desire uh, should be changed in order to have um, better quality, um, greater supply and, and better stable prices. He's the MD with Recycle Raw based in, uh, in Dhaka, Bangladesh. After which we'll hear about this ambitious initiative of accelerating circularity, what they have achieved in America, what's the plan for Europe and Asia. And for that, we'll have Ms. Petra Schweiger, she leads the efforts for accelerating circularity in Europe, and she has rich experience uh, based on her time in, in Asia. Finally, in terms of actual experiences, we'll also hear from uh, Mr. Massimiliano Tropiano. He's based in Cambodia, and he will give us some insights on the projects that GIZ has undertaken in Cambodia with partners and why GIZ initiated a regional textile waste mapping on post-industrial textile waste. To sum it up, we'll talk about the next steps, and that is with regards to an ongoing research project uh, that GIZ has funded of mapping this textile waste in the region to identify what's happening, why is it happening, and having some recommendations. And for that, we'll have Ms. Fatima Jahan, who is the project leader for this initiative. So let's look a little further ahead as to why are we talking about this today? So I think we all realize the power and the importance of uh, the textile sector, in addition to the employment it generates and the um, economic aspects of it for countries or the diversity that it provides. Um, and of course, the happiness it provides to each one of us where we wear a garment um, that is reflecting our mood or the occasion. It also has some other impacts. That is, 
with regards to its need for raw materials, its need for water, and its need for energy, which all also translates into emissions. At the same time, there are some facts or situation which is not so pleasant in terms of what happens to these textiles once we decide we no longer want them for whatever reasons. The focus for today will be on this topic of waste on production level and consumer level. But perhaps at the end of this webinar, uh, we might uh, reconsider if we should be calling it uh, waste or should we talk about it as potential secondary material? Should we talk about it as treasure? What name we should give it? That's uh, left to you. So if you all have any question, if you all have any comments, please share this via the chat and Q&A. Um, at the moment, of course, uh, all of you are muted. So the best that we can do is you pass on your comments, your questions, give us your feedback so that uh, our panelists can respond and share their perspective. Now, when we look at the simplified view of consumer, post-consumer and post-industrial waste, if we were to look at a value chain, let's say of a monomaterial cotton, uh, what we see is this, uh, it is complex. What we will focus on today is a little bit about what happens at post-industrial level and post-consumer level to this waste and how it can potentially go back, what can be done in order to make sure that the value of this is uh, maximized in the hands of the one who generates it. And why do we talk of value? Because it is a lot of money. This is the data as of 2019, yeah? So it is uh, still pre-COVID. What you see, the top exporter of textile scraps in the world is Bangladesh exporting 84.4 million. Yeah? What happens to the remaining waste? How much of it is being recycled? How much of it is being, um, uh, let's say, incinerated? And uh, how much of it is um, ending up into landfills? All of those are interesting aspects. And, and I think you as manufacturers, you as being on the ground have a better visibility. So it will be useful to have your interaction and your comments. And while we are on the topic of money, let's talk about money then. So if we can have the first question, and if you all can provide your feedback via this quick poll question. Uh, Ryan, can we have the first poll question, please? So when we talk of recycled textile materials or these secondary materials, can you all please share your experience? Are you seeing that they are actually cheaper than virgin material, or do you feel that uh, their price um, at an equal level to virgin material? Or do you feel they're actually more expensive, or just a little bit cheaper or perhaps cheaper, but uh, it has higher risks and costs because uh, you need to validate and verify uh, the quality and also the chemical compliance of this. So thank you to 30% uh, of the participants who have already responded. If some of you could also respond, so we meet the 50% uh, threshold and we get an idea on what you are experiencing all right so uh ryan maybe in about uh, three seconds uh, we can have a look at the results so if anybody else wants to then please pitch in all right so what we see is your experience is that they are more expensive so we'll hear a reflection from our panelists as to should they be more expensive or are they experiencing some reasons which is making this so-called waste more expensive? All right, thank you for that. Then let's also look at uh, the initiatives, international initiatives, which are focusing on this topic of textile waste and recycling. What you see here is an overview of initiatives focusing on different aspects, sustainability elements for the textile industry. And we see that there are at least five initiatives which also address the topic of textile waste and recycle content. So there's the SAC HIG FEM, uh, the, the Fair Trade Standard, but we also see Blue Sign requirements and the UN Alliance. Now, at the same time, there are policy initiatives which are focusing especially on textiles. So on one hand, there's a revision of the Waste Framework Directive in EU. And at the same time, there's the uh, much anticipated sustainable textile strategy, which is going to come out before end of March, which will also look at sustainability aspects for textiles. And while all of that is coming up, what is already taking place is for all the facilities which are going through a HIG FEM verifications, 
there are already questions in there wherein facilities are asked to report on whether they are diverting these discarded materials from landfills incinerators and whether they are upcycling and passing it back into the circular economy and it doesn't end there we've seen that there's uh, this continuous focus from academia and research on the topic of textile waste both on post industrial and post consumer level what you see at the bottom is a post from 5 days back where another research organization is looking for a freelance researcher uh, concerning industrial post industrial textile waste and there are many more examples i'm sure that you have come across but it doesn't stop at academia there have been practical implementations and cases on how waste is being recycled and we'll hear about one more practical case from accelerating circularity so let's start off looking at what's happening on the ground and uh, it's best to hear from a practitioner so for that uh, we'd like to request uh, razak if you can please um, share with us and and compress the many months of work that you have done within 10 or 12 minutes and share your experience yeah thank you mr rakesh to give a chance to describe about ground workers support for textile waste recycling industry in bangladesh and this is abdul razak from recycle raw limited in bangladesh before moving through the slides i want to give some information at a glance uh, regarding the apple industry and also bangladesh apple industry uh, you know uh, it is around 2 trillion business around the world and 150 billion garments are moving each year from one country to another and also if we see the manufacturing market share china is holding is still the biggest market and it's around 30% but it's reducing 1% each year due to the environment issue and whose business is moving to bangladesh as well as vietnam and also some other countries and luckily bangladesh is still holding the second position but market share is like 6.8% individually but european countries combinedly is holding around 22.5% and uh, if we go uh, regarding post consumer west uh, usa alone is uh, producing 12 million metric ton annually uh, from there we can get uh, we can assume that the whole world is producing a bigger quantity of post consumer west so it's need better Uh, management and also in europe only 3.7 kilograms per capita incineration is happening and so this is uh, also unfortunate and uh, regarding pre consumer waste if i want to share something like the global pre consumer waste recyclable uh, waste i mean recyclable waste will be around 9 million metric ton annually and bangladesh itself is producing 0.6 million metric ton per year and it's really unfortunate that still 1% uh, textile waste is back into clothing supply chain loop and uh, it doesn't mean that the total quantity is going to incinerate it a landfill but uh, the most of the cases we found that they are going to in doubt if uh, the waste value is going to downwards like is I, i would better say it's down cycled not up cycled and it is also estimated in bangladesh that around 20% peak consumer waste goes for incineration in terms of uh, brick production as well as industrial boiler in our know, factories due to extremely low value if i would say uh, regarding recycle raw uh, we always call it one step solution uh, what we do 
we we collect materials from we collect uh projection from different buyers i mean our recyclers and then we we uh, better get a very good feedback from them that how much quantity they record in a year then we plan our our production team plan for material collection that is scale up and then we uh, we separate raw materials i mean the waste materials in different categories like uh, oven need denim hard waste is completely separate and and then we separate according to composition and some of the recyclers record dyes and chemicals wise and also color wise and some recycler also demand for size wise it's really not too much easy task to separate this way and finally we go for filtration to remove any kind of hazardous materials or any dust and then we go for inspection in our internal inspection we call, we call it equal inspection after that we confirm for bill confirmation and then we go for shipping to the recycler and uh, for the upcoming season we are planning for at another one process like uh, fiber shedding in our own process so that it can add some more value on the other hand we also work with some organization uh, we call them our stakeholders from european countries and also some brands itself and also recyclers they have a very good relationship with bgmea and also good relationship with brands and on also factories they they give us a chance to work directly with factories we collect pre uh, pre segregated waste from the factories directly and then we 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 confirm the total uh, to, total quality uh, like again uh, maybe a little bit more uh, uh, filtration and then scale up bailing and sorting and then logistic support to them and, uh, and that's all about recycle raw activities some challenges we are facing as well uh, i think brands on my experiences i would say the brands are facing some challenges like recycle yarns are expensive yeah, uh, yeah. I would also say that recycle yams are expensive presently because, on a normal sense, what the consumer thinks that recycle materials cost should be lower than the virgin materials. But in in the practical cases, it's compared to the virgin materials, the prices is not that cheaper due to uh, several issues. Uh, the main issues we are facing in in the ground that there is a lot of middlemen who are passing the ball towards the goal post, but they're not adding any value. So this is the big uh, portion you can see like, not, not just one or two middlemen, it can be like five to six, even sometimes 10. So it's really, really expensive on that perspective. At the same time, not much recycle facilities. You know that uh, Rakesh already told that Bangladesh is the, uh, bigger uh, biggest exporter in the world for recycled waste materials oh, just because of we don't have any recycled facility we don't have enough i would say enough recycled facilities in our country so if we can establish the recycled facilities in our own countries then the waste will not move away there will be no transportation just for transportation in twice so it will be cheaper i guess for the recycler's perspective, there is also challenges for scale up the materials because one factory is not producing a lot of homogeneous materials at a single time. So scale up is a big, uh, big issues. So Recycle Raw is working for scale up the materials in our own facility from different factories. And, uh, and another point is lack of quality full feed stock. Actually the middleman and or any uh, sorting company, first of all, they need to know, they need to understand the quality of recyclers requirement, and then they can able to fit better feed stock. So some cases is uh, some communication gap or middleman can, if any 
uh, to meet a goal, uh, like need a one-stop solution, I would say. And unstable raw materials prices is, is really true because um, sometimes some buyers come to us to make a contract for whole year prices and whole year quantities. It's really difficult for us to quote a single price for whole year because there's a lot of middlemen and they are like acting a buyer. So there's a lot of buyers, but waste is kind of uh, uh, fixed. So we cannot increase, it's a byproduct. So there is a unstable situation of prices. And on terms of recycled raw, yeah, we are also facing some challenges regarding informal business. First of all, I would say waste business is an informal business in Bangladesh, but we are still working to make it formalized with some of our stock stakeholders and organization. They're giving us support from some uh, Europe, European countries, and they're also working in government level to solve this problem, these really good things I saw. And uh, biggest problem is fund crisis. Yeah, because you know that textile industry is much more popular to deal their business by LC. But in this sector, we need to spread a lot of money and liquid money in the market. And even is as advanced. So it's difficult to grow up. But by the way, we are working our level best to meet this requirement. And uh, once I try to deal post-consumer waste in Bangladesh, but there's the embargo of our government from our government level that uh, we cannot import the waste material from outside. So it's not possible presently, but I should government, uh, I think government should understand the importance of uh, recycling industry. It can be asset if we can build a lot of recycling facility and import the raw materials from outside as well, not exporting the raw materials to outside. I have some uh, solution proposal from our own, and uh, this is a uh, better use and reuse, I think, more natural fiber as much as possible, and uh, find a better solution for blended composition because Blended composition is really uh, difficult to handle presently due to uh, uh, due, there's the reason the quant the price is uh, very lower in blended composition. And regarding the blended composition materials ultimately goes to incineration mostly. So, we should find a better solution how to implement blended composition in a better way, in a better price. And byproduct management from the factory level should be initiated at the beginning uh, establishment of the factories, how they, they want to deal the byproduct. And regarding pre consumer waste, waste should be segregated at source by color and composition. I, I mean, from factory, the waste should be segregated. And it's, it's not so much difficult, and it's already proved that it's, it's, it's possible. And you know, the reverse resources is working for this project, and we're also the stakeholders in this project. We saw that it's, it's possible, it's possible. And recycling should start at, at its source country. I already explained that uh, we should establish, we should emphasize on recycling factories in our own countries and more potentially reduce non-value added middlemen from the chain to decline the prices. And at the same time, brands should pay enough for sustainable products to support the industry. Otherwise, we are not able to uh, make a 100% compliance facilities so that uh, compliance is also a sustainability. So we also need to get better payment from brands. And at the end, I would say I would say that prepare and support sorting and logistic partners like Recycle Raw or any other to play in a global platform so that we can work like a one-stop solution to get materials from factories directly and 
and uh, make it preparation for better quality and scale up and then send to the recyclers directly. There will be no middleman in sight. And further, if you have any queries, don't feel hesitate to communicate. And that's all from my part. And I would suggest that uh, Rakesh, Mr. Rakesh, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much, Razak, for, for sharing your experience, for sharing some of those challenges, but also sharing some recommendations. It's uh, very useful. So have you looked at what's happening in terms of post-industrial textile material and, and how it's being handled? And of course, the topic of blended uh, fibers and the challenge. Uh, Petra, uh, your team uh, decided to take up that challenge. Yeah, You went for garment, uh, post-consumer garments and looked at the recycling. So if you could please share uh, your experience, um, also some background as to why and what happened, what were the emotions like when you all decided to go with this initiative, how many years it took for uh, convincing uh, your partners and now what has happened and uh, what do you plan for the next steps, yeah. Sure, thank you very much Rakesh and to Freindland also for the opportunity, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure. So yeah, my name is Petra. I'm the program manager of Accelerating Circularity. I'm based out of Austria in Europe, and I have been in textile and apparel Paris supply chain for quite some time as well. So I was living and working in Asia. I was long in Bangladesh, Hong Kong and China, working in product development, sourcing, buying. And I have not seen the participants list, but uh, I might have crossed paths with some of you over all these years. So who is Accelerating Circularity? We are a US-based nonprofit organization founded by Carla Magruder only two years ago. So we're very young. Uh, she herself has been in the industry for 40 plus years. And that's basically her motivation. Uh, she has seen the industry for a very long time. She knows it very well. She has seen the impact um, uh, sorry, <laughs> she has seen the impact environmentally and socially. Looking at circularity, there is existing infrastructure here that needs to be connected for sure. Sorry, sorry. So I made the mistake of like having something open. Um, we hear about the brands that pledge to use 100% sustainable materials by 2025, and that pretty much sums up her motivation to found accelerating circularity, to connect all the different stakeholders, to create the common language, to facilitate among them, and in brief, to accelerate circularity. So uh, circularity means different strategies. Uh, nowadays, we talk about re-commerce, repair, uh, resale, but here at Accelerating Circularity, we focus on recycling textile to textile recycling. Since to date, our, our regions are the US and Europe, we focus on post-consumer materials. Uh, there is plenty. Rakesh, you mentioned before um, to find maybe another word for waste. We have actually started to call it spent textiles because we think after period of use phase, all the value is spent and that's why we coined the term spent textiles. So meaning once uh, these materials are collected and sorted and they are no longer wearable, they cannot be sold to any other market for any other use anymore. They often go into landfills or they are incinerated as Rasak was already telling us. Here in Europe, of course, it very often goes into waste for energy, which yes, it does create uh, energy on a cold morning like today. But at the end of the day, all the value, the resource, the raw material is lost forever. So since we focus on post-consumer, we have to include and we want to include a number of different stakeholders. So we bring in collectors and sorters. These are charities. These are for-profit collectors and sorters that have been doing this for a very long time. But clearly, they collect and sort according to the waste hierarchy. So whatever fraction that we feel goes into a high quality recycling is not the high quality recycled material that is required by the recyclers. 
So we work with a number of different recyclers. We have mechanical, we have chemical, we have equipment suppliers on board as well. So it's a whole range of different technologies, different feedstock requirements, different outputs, different maturity levels. Then of course, we need also the traditional supply chain of yarn spinners, fabric mills. They are the absolute experts in understanding the fiber, understanding the flakes that come out. And last but not least, brand and retail. We know their pledges. We know that the demand needs to boost. I think Rasak was also very clear about that. So for one, it's about designing for recycling. That is definitely important to turn off the tap. But more importantly is that brand and retailers understand the output materials that come out of the recycling processes understand the performance, the limitations, not only the price difference as well, but really understand the, the outputs and bring it back into their collections. So that is very important for us as well. So uh, as I mentioned, to date, we are only at two regions. We are in, we have a very small team in the US. We have one in Europe that it's basically me. So we only started two years ago. So hopefully we can expand into different and other regions very soon. So at the core of our projects, we have a steering committee that always exists of experts along the value chain. So here you see uh, the ones that are joining the US team and also the European one. And they are the ones giving us guidance as well. So, but apart from uh, those companies, we work with 80 plus uh, additional companies in the various working groups and focus groups. So how do we work? Um, so you can see here our way of working. Uh, we of course have, as an organization, we have a bit of a theoretical phase, phase one, where we research map model link. How do we and our stakeholders visualize a circular system of textile to textile recycling? We, of course, also have challenges very similar to what Basak was telling us. We have bottlenecks, especially when it comes to pre-processing, for example. We, have, we also want to understand the opportunities, and especially in Europe, and Rakesh was mentioning already, the EU textile strategy is going to come out very soon. And it's definitely going to impact the industry in terms of eco design, recycled content, waste prevention, and management. So, we take up all these things and create the topics and contents around all these points. But the heart and the focus of our project, given also our background in the supply chain, we're very hands on, is definitely the trial phase. So we, whatever we were visualizing and discussing, we want to put into practice and really pressure test the system. So we are here in Europe about to start our trial phase. Um, meaning that we use the existing infrastructure of the collectors sorters we hopefully create some new pre-processing infrastructure we use all the different uh, recycling technologies that are out there for a different kinds of yarns materials products um, we of course integrate the conventional supply chain of the yarn spinners in the way i mentioned it in the brands and retailers as well again to not only design for recycling, but especially bring these output materials back into, the, into their portfolio and start a beginning of life with these materials. So we always talk about commercial scale here. So we are moving beyond the proof of concept. So we are moving uh, towards mainstream. That's definitely our goal. Uh, so for us, it means, of course, a multitude of different stakeholders that are included. And in Europe to date, we have around 30 companies signed up for the trials. We're going to kick off by mid-April, so there is still some time for campaigning. Uh, we're going to have eventually different yarns, materials for a number of different products. But for us, it's also important to be able to meet the MOQs determined by the different uh, segments. So that for us is at commercial scale, at least in round number one, and hopefully in round number two, we can go a little bit further. 
So um, this is going to start off in April here in Europe, in the US. They are a bit ahead already, so they have been working on the pilots already. So we're going to, as much as possible, have a regular product development phase and then bulk phase. So the entire timeline is at least one and a half years. So along the way, we're going to collect data to evaluate and assess and also hopefully being able to create feedback loops that definitely help also the wider industry. So the physical output we are going to do, you can see here in this small icon. So it's rather basic, nothing crazy. It's going to be cut and so circular knits. We're going to have twirls and canvas. We're going to have denims, hopefully, and some home textiles. So uh, yeah, this ends already my presentation. As I was saying, we are very young, only two years old. So right now in the US and Europe, but of course we'd like to expand into other regions very soon. We are definitely also looking into opportunities, how to have output materials from these regions flow back into the wider, more global supply chain. So that will be very interesting for sure as well. And lastly, we are also about to start with a waste flow study to understand, and I think that Rasak was saying was very interesting for us as well, because we would like to understand where materials should be exported to based on the importing countries' capabilities needs and then clearly also regulations to really be able to process these materials. So I hope this helped understanding what accelerating circularity is about. Stay tuned. We have a website. You can reach out to me anytime. And thank you so much again. Excellent, Petra. Thank you for opening the window into uh, the work of your team members. And as my daughter says, every young person has clearer and better vision. So all the best uh, with the next steps and uh, we will all be anxiously waiting and waiting to celebrate uh, and your learnings, but also your challenges and your experience. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yes. So now having looked at post-industrial, having looked at what's happening on post-consumer level, let's take an example of uh, an ambitious, young, uh, up-and-coming country, Cambodia and its textile sector and how it's um, addressing, it's um, uh, refining its own processes um, to align with not just this national determined contribution, but also giving a practical example of uh, addressing the topic of textile waste. For that, we will have uh, Mr. Massimiliano Tropiano. So the people that Massimiliano likes um, are allowed to call him Massi. So Massi, if you can please take the next 10, 12 minutes and take us through uh, your journey, GIZ's journey, looking at uh, the topic of textile waste material or spent textile or spent uh, um, textiles during production, what you have uh, experienced, what you have observed, and what you plan to do ahead. Masi, we can see your slides, uh, but we are just not able to hear you yet. Is it just me, Ryan, or? Oh, uh... uh, yes, oh, I don't yes. think I can hear you just now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes, okay so just, let me just switch off uh, one second. Yeah. So uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation just before uh, me, my fellow panelists. I uh, would like to spend a couple of words first about the project where I am involved with. And um, yeah. And then we will go in. So uh, the project is called uh, Fabric. Fabric is a regional uh, project of uh, GIZ and it has uh, into it uh, six countries. Um, it, it aims at uh, uh, getting together private sector, 
companies, private companies, business, business associations, ministries, and of course, trade unions and civil society. We have, a, would say, a vast range of um, tools and actions and initiatives where we are working with um, from uh, the social side, from the environmental side, as well as from the circularity side. And very recently, we uh, decided actually to open a couple of years ago, uh, the, the, the topic of the circularity and to really dive in. I remember in your presentation, there was the, <clears throat> there is a, a reverse and inverted pyramid uh, of the preferences that uh, goes toward the circularity. And uh, actually, um, at the top, there is uh, uh, basically the, the zero waste, then there is a reduce the waste, and after that there is recycling. Unfortunately, in the garment sector, as per the technology that is used uh, today in the world, not only in Cambodia and Southeast Asia, there is no much to do unless, uh, yes, the buyers are working on reducing the waste and the designer side, but let's face it, most of the time, the, the, the really, the, the, there is no concern too much on that side. And therefore the lowing in fruit was really the recycling. So uh, there you go. We decided to go into the recycling and particularly in the post-consumer, post-industrial waste. The post-consumer was is certainly not a big trouble of the Southeast Asia or the sourcing countries. So what we did is to investigate a bit more on, uh, on waste. And um, pretty quickly we realized that uh, we needed to do a, a, a small study uh, on uh, uh, where is this waste going and how is this waste treated and what are the paths uh, that this waste follows. I can uh, hear Petra talking about international waste flow, which is, I would say, an extension of what uh, we, we, we didn't do that part. We did the, 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 the flow of the waste inside one country first in Cambodia, and we found uh, something interesting. Uh, basically, out of the industrial waste in Cambodia, it's a small country, uh, industrial, industrial, uh, how to say, um, frame is uh, pretty much related to the garment sector. Therefore, the industrial waste in Cambodia is 60% textile. Now, this is uh, a number that, in my opinion, is really staggering. Uh, it means that uh, almost uh, two, two thirds of the industrial waste of Cambodia is made of textile and textile residual. Um, but if we count also leather scrap or plastic material, which are actually similar, uh, they could come also from, from uh, um, some sort of garment process, uh, then uh, we have a much higher process. Therefore, we started to understand uh, how much was collected and how in the country and how much was generated. And we didn't have much of a data about the generation of it, uh, the generation of the, of the waste. So we, we were pretty lucky. Uh, Cambodia being a small country uh, has uh, extremely few fabric mills. So we did a very simple calculation. We took all the import of Cambodia in terms of, in terms of tons. Uh, we took an estimate of uh, 10 to 15% of that tons as a wastage. Uh, we know the wastage can vary from 3% up to 20% depending on the, depending on the style, but we took an average conservative of 10 to 15%. And therefore, we had the, 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 let's say, the fabric waste generated in the country. We joined this number with the, with the number of tons that were collected by a uh, number of tons of industrial waste that were collected. And we did the 60% of it. And uh, basically, the green is collected by Sarom, which is the industrial waste operator that collects all of it in the entire country. The red is the estimate of the industrial textile waste generated. And we found out basically that in uh, 
at least in 2019, there was a, a huge gap of more than 80,000 tons of uh, waste that was um, somehow disappearing. And uh, <clears throat> we asked ourselves, uh, is it burned? Probably part of it. Is it exported? Probably part of it. Is it recycled? Probably very less. Does it go in the landfill? Probably part of it, uh, or is uh, just dumped outside. Uh, I mean, this is the landfill means illegal landfill because the legal landfill is the green part, right? And we started digging and digging into it. And we uh, found out that uh, there are also other reasons why the factory do not always, are not always so clear about waste. Essentially, these are all textile that are imported duty free and therefore are not supposed to be sold in the country. Therefore, the moment you monetize your waste by selling it or exporting it, that's an illegal action and it would attract taxation. Therefore, the factories and all the managers uh, and the entire economy is actually managed in an informal way. This is also partially the reason why there is this uh, informal sector in Bangladesh or in Pakistan, but might not be the reason, but in Cambodia, actually, taxation plays a big, a big part because there are no mills uh, and all the, all the fabric is imported uh, duty free. Uh, China had a ban on uh, import of waste two years ago. As you can see, 2017 and 2018, they generated and they collected were very, very close to each other. It means that they were basically whatever was extra was probably exported. The moment China closed the, the border to the textile waste, those 80,000 tons of difference shows up. And, uh, and uh, actually, yeah, uh, this is probably one of the reasons why the, 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 the country actually is suffering of many illegal uh, uh, landfills. So continuing with it, um, we took not only the initiative, we, we, of course, we had more appetite for some more data and we decided to embark on a study uh, for the entire region. And we were well aware that uh, the informal sector was so difficult to break uh, or difficult to study, let's say in Bangladesh or in Pakistan or also in India. But we actually were not interested in studying too much about about the illegal sector, but we want we really wanted to know the flow. Where does it go? How much does it end up? And uh, Fatima will uh, later on elaborate quite a lot about it. And um, uh, one thing I already realized, a lot of it goes to, yes, it goes to India, but a lot of it goes to Europe. And uh, with all the due respect to the recyclers in, <clears throat> in Europe, uh, to be honest, would be a preferable option to recycle those, uh, those fabrics in in situ in, in in the country within the country therefore offering a new set of textile within the country which are recycle based the challenge is that most of the technology used is patent or is company owned and is not shared and therefore it stays in europe and does not trickle down to the to the southeast asia so we decided anyhow to um, to partner with uh, uh, all the actors of the chain as a following option to the to the waste study in Cambodia, we decided to foster the feasibility study of a new technology. Um, we identified partners from all the supply chain, private sectors and development sector, and uh, uh, potential of identifying partnering with new actor to make the project a success. Essentially, we decided to go uh, to join the dots of all the uh, of all the tire uh, the various tires of the supply chain uh, we have uh, we decided to go for a machine uh, that is uh, at the moment being scaled up 
to industrial uh, scale, to industrial uh, size. Uh, it's not yet a huge, uh, a huge size, but is an interesting size to be considered industrial. It's a machine that can address the blended material, particularly uh, polyester blends. Uh, I would say that polyester cotton is the preferable option with a maximum one or two percent up to 3% of lycra or elastan or uh, similar materials. And therefore, <clears throat> from, from the scrap of the garment producer, which is not scrap anymore, uh, in, from this machine, we, could, we can extract uh, something of a, a sort of polyester fluff, to give you an idea, which is clean and polished. That could be uh, hand over to a yarn, producer to be respun into a spun polyester. Again, uh, for what concerned the blend of cotton, uh, the cotton actually is uh, uh, becomes a cellulosic powder, which can be used uh, at the fiber entire four at, by the fiber producer uh, on the ground as a sort of fertilizer. Um, after that, we decided to uh, involve uh, brands, so to say the buyers, the buyers that are at the end of the chain, uh, almost at the end of the chain, and they will be the, the, the one who will create the demand for, for such uh, recycled fabrics. Therefore, therefore uh, let's say, um, connecting the dots of the supply chain. Uh, the people involved are this one uh, in what you see in the in the presentation. Dakota is uh, a big garment company with around ten thousand workers in Cambodia and three and three uh, sites. They generate. Um, well enough material waste uh, of what this machine potentially can handle at the moment. Um, we are talking about um, the machine can handle approximately two, two tons a day and they generate probably three, four, depending on the season, even eight tons a day of waste. And um, Chipmong in C is a, a company that is interested in investing in this machine because they are already having a co-processing plan in their cement kiln where they burn the waste and also fabric waste given by the brands. H&M uh, Foundation is at the base of it because they founded this study for the technology to, to the HK Rita and the HK Rita is the technological partner, you can say. And VF, I guess everybody knows who is VF in this room and they don't need they don't need an interruption. Uh, that's it. Therefore, we decided to, to have this initiative and to, 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 to foster a feasibility study to see if this machine could potentially work here. The feasibility study is about to start. Uh, the tender has already been won by one of the biggest consultancy company in the world. And uh, we, you can rest assured that we will uh, share the results as soon as we have it. Uh, of course, the, some of the results will be confidential in terms of numbers and will be open only to the, site, to the MOU signatories. But majority of it, of course, will be actually of public knowledge. Uh, that's it, Rakesh. Yes. I would like to thank you, the GIZ, for, for a belief, because I come from prior sector. And when we came up with this idea, the GIZ management decided to believe in it and, and go for it. So, therefore, kudos to them, yeah. to us. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Masi. And all the best with the next steps of the feasibility study. Let's look a little uh, further ahead into what happens with uh, this study. What started off in Cambodia, how is it being reflected into the other countries in Asia? For that, we'll have Ms. Fatima Jahan. She's the project leader of uh, this textile waste mapping study. And while Fatima, we have uh, several colleagues in different countries focused on this and many uh, days of efforts already gone in and many more that comes ahead. 
If you can please take us through a, a short journey, through a quick short journey in about eight to 10 minutes, yeah? So Fatima, yeah. over to you. Thank you so much. As Masi already shared, the big picture of the big project is going on the fabric. We are doing the feasibility study in the countries, uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Pakistan, Cambodia, and China. And it's a regional project and uh, uh, among the different topics we are covering the waste management part. And uh, uh, we know that different type of wastages are uh, generating in textile industry. But for this study, our focus will be on the cutting wastages, uh, generating from the cutting, mainly fabric wastages, and additionally, the end rolls, which is generates from the factory. Uh, very shortly, the brief of the project, uh, the background is to uh, identify the recycling opportunities of textile waste. And uh, our focus already shared uh, to the end rolls and the cutting uh, fabric waste generates from the cutting. And the objective is to analyze the fabric waste system as well as we know that the countrywide regulation is very important to implement any uh, new initiatives. Uh, so it's important to analyze the regulatory frameworks also. And finally, our planning is to outcome is uh, how we can uh, create the wastages or take it to the circular economy or economy and create the income source of it. To make the project successful, we have some strategic plan. And first of all, our goal is to map the waste stream. And there was a, a different data collection we have to depend. And uh, for that, different stakeholders are involved on that, uh, including the factories, related waste handlers, and brands. And we're collecting the data uh, both from the face-to-face -face interview and we have some online data collection tool also. Then uh, we will go through a rigorous uh, data analysis and uh, basing on the analysis so that we, can, we could come to the conclusion, uh, maybe what is happening in the industry right now, uh, where the West ages are go right now, uh, uh, someone is uh, comfortable to recycle the wastages, maybe someone is comfortable to just sell it to the, uh, to the th parties, and why these are happening, why different factories or different people are choosing the different opportunities, and uh, what are the challenges they are facing. Uh, uh, so these all will be the, our uh, plan for the studies. Um, our, uh, we will have uh, the, uh, first of all, to collect the data, we, we have created some interview questions and, uh, so, and contacting with the stakeholders, basing on the information, collecting from the countrywide. Uh, we will collect uh, from different countries. And uh, finally, we will map it or analyze it regionally, how, how we could um, incorporate it regionally. And uh, during this stakeholder interview, we are collecting, first of all, the core waste issues. And uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are considering the cause and effect, how and uh, how in the stakeholders are involved with this study, who are affected with it, and why they are choosing these different options. Uh, that means uh, waste burning or waste landfilling and what are the effects on that and so that we can mitigate these uh, options and uh, uh, could, uh, collect it to the circular economy. Uh, this is one example of stakeholder mapping, how we are doing. We are uh, considering different uh, brands and factories, associations that involved to this, this study purpose. Uh, so what we are expecting uh, for this study, you know, uh, maybe the funding is uh, doing from GIZ and of course technical support is given from GIZ, but ultimately you were the stakeholders who are involved in this project are very important 
and uh, to uh, make this uh, project successful, your information and your inputs are very important. And uh, for that, uh, we are going to recognize uh, from two sides that who are giving their time, effort, and knowledge about the industry to us. Uh, we will provide a recognition later from to Greenland. And uh, of course, after uh, co completing the project, ZIZ will decide it how they, uh, they could include the stakeholders to the further projects or further initiative. And finally, from our side, our planning is to maybe uh, making all the stakeholders together and giving the recognition later uh, in front of uh, each other so that we could have better communication to each other. Uh, as uh, we are responsible uh, in different country, countrywide responsibilities are defined uh, and uh, uh, working uh, to identify the actual scenario. These are the team we are working in different countries. Uh, if uh, you have any queries or any comments, you can share with us and contact with us from the country level to the contact persons. This, uh, finally, what we, are, we need from your side, anyone, if you want to join willingly to this project to share your view, to share your thoughts, uh, then we will be very happy. Uh, and it will, of course, uh, uh, help us or ZIZ to come to the, uh, to get the actual scenario of what is happening currently to the industry. So you are open, uh, you can contact with us who are willing to participate in the uh, study part. Thank you, if any question. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I think uh, we can repeat what you already said uh, earlier, Masi, you said uh, kudos to GIZ and kudos to you. So of course, kudos to GIZ for uh, initiating such a research study. And um, yeah, we, we are all excited to see what we learn, what we identify, what we unravel. Um, so that was a call to action in case uh, you have facilities, in case you yourself would want to give some feedback, then you have the contact details uh, to reach us. And then finally, if you want to be part of the review board for the data, then we will also pass it on to GIZ team and they would be uh, looking at who can have a first look in order to provide critique or comments or suggestions on the data, on the report, on the findings. Now, having look, heard all the interventions so far, starting from a waste sorter level, in Bangladesh from Razak and Recycle Raw, then looking at what's happening on garment to garment and post-consumer or spent textiles uh, via accelerating Secularity and Petra, looking at what's happening in Cambodia and the regional waste mapping project. There's a question for you, for all of you on the call. What do you feel should be the first hurdle? What should be the first topic that should be overcome in order to go ahead with regards to textile scrap especially? Uh, do you feel that uh, we need uh, government policy and uh, enforcement to overcome the sinister uh, criminal elements or the mafia? Do you feel that we need this greater direct connection between the supplier of textile scrap and uh, the recycler or the sorter? Do you feel that uh, we need better material traceability so that uh, it'd be easier for carrying on quality checks and compliance of this recycled material or to increase the visibility uh, for the manufacturers who are the generators of this textile scrap that they realize and they can see better what is the price and value of this material in the open market so that they themselves implement resource efficiency measures so that they themselves as the creator or generator of this scrap be able to identify who they can work with yeah, to get the best uh, price and if you feel that something else should take place then please take advantage of the chat box and please type in your message as to what you feel is the first hurdle that should be overcome in order that the industry, that the generator of that textile scrap be able to get the best possible value and there be greater efficiency so that uh, cost be addressed. So for 45% of the participants who have responded already, thank you very much. Let's keep it open, Ryan, for three more seconds. Okay. Here we see the results and uh, what's clear, 
based on your feedback is there has to be some kind of policy and better enforcement that those um, sinister elements um, are not able to adversely impact. Now, before we, we end, um, I wanted to ask one question. So thank you everybody for responding to questions. Yes, a recording of the webinar and also the link to the presentation will be shared. Uh, and before we end, I wanted to ask, what is the next thing that you will do after this webinar? Let's start with you, Petra, on the topic of textile, spent textiles management, waste management. What is it that you're going to do next today, in the next hour? So for us, it's definitely the trial phase that is coming up. So today is actually a crucial day because we are sending out mm -hmm. the official agreements to all the stakeholders that have committed. But as I said in my presentation, the campaigning is still ongoing for the next few weeks and then we kick off by mid-April. Okay, thank you very much. And, and how about yourself, uh, Razak? What will be, you be focusing on in the next hour or couple of hours today? Yeah, uh, actually, recycling is a kind of passion for me, and uh, we always look for, uh, try to study that how recycling is uh, moving forward and how to add some value, something like that. And uh, uh, after this session, uh, I'm much more motivated that different part of the world, everybody is working for a noble job, I, I would say. So maybe uh, I will I'll study a little bit more about GIZ now and uh, let's see how, how we can cooperate each other. Right. And how about yourself, Masi? What is your plan for the next couple of hours? <laughs> My, I, I, I wouldn't talk about the next couple of hours. I would like to talk for the next couple of years. Um, <laughs> look and foster and push for new kind of recycling and recyclers mm -hmm. initiative in Asia. Uh, it's really um, something that is not right if the waste is shipped into Europe and uh, with, with all the GH greenhouse gas emission connected to it, uh, whereas actually it could be, it could be, would, with similar technology, it could be used and recycled here uh, in this part of the world. Okay, great, thanks. And Fatima, while uh, we hear about what some of our panelists are going to do today, uh, we also hear about Masi's long-term. I'm curious from you, Fatima, uh, every day is different, of course, and what's your plan for the remaining part of today on the topic of textile waste? Yes, of course, as part of this project, I would like to say I have to uh, identify uh, that uh, what are the challenges correctly we are having and uh, how the mapping is going on and uh, to mitigate the challenges and create a better uh, recycling opportunity countrywide. All right, great. And there is one question uh, to me that uh, if uh, anyone can join individually for this project or through this company, uh, first of all, uh, on, on the topic which you were interested to talk with us, you are very open to, we are very open to discuss individual person also. Okay, great, thank you. Um, on my side, I will be going into uh, the European Union Circular Economy Stakeholder Forum, where we will be having a dialogue on the topic of textile waste. So if any of you have uh, the time and interest, then March 1st and March 2nd, the European Union Circular Economy Stakeholder Forum, uh, please join us there. I want to thank all of you, our panelists, for taking the time, for sharing your experience, your experience, the work of your team, but also sharing your wisdom. And thank you, of course, to all the participants for uh, actively uh, being part of it, for responding to polls, for taking time. And Ryan, thank you very much for making sure everything works out uh, perfectly for us. Thanks a lot then. Um, take care. Bye-bye.